Good morning. It's good to be with you here today. As the Dean mentioned, I'm visiting here this week. Um, I've taught before at uh, Tyndall, but it's always been in June or July. So it's a bit different being here in first week of January. Um, I grew up in Alberta, so I'm kind of used to cold winters, but the last few decades I've been in the Seattle area, so I've kind of lost my tolerance for cold, cold weather, excuse me. But, um, but anyways, it's, it's warm in here, and we sense the presence of God in here. So as we turn our attention now to the word, um, let's do that. Typically when I preach, like most often people do, I will select a passage. This time what I would like to do though is, you know, sometimes we miss things when we look at just maybe one passage, especially as we're looking at the Gospels. And the message we'll be giving us today comes from the Gospel of Mark. And because uh, oftentimes when we look at one passage, one thing we do miss out is sometimes what the Gospel writers are communicating as they put a series of passages together. So, but I won't take time to read the extended passage. What I will do, though, is summarize that for you. Basically, we'll be looking at texts that come from Mark 4.35 down to the end of chapter 5, 5.43. But I think many of these passages will be familiar to you, so I'll just basically summarize, and then we'll get into uh, what I would like to address. Um, basically, you have a series of, of passages there, starting with the stilling of the storm. So Jesus gets into a boat with his disciples to cross over to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. And as you know, they encounter a storm there. Once they get to the other side, um, they encounter what? The demoniac who's living among the tombs. Okay. And then you have, pro well, what is the most extended and the most famous exorcism scene in the Gospels? And then they cross back over the sea, and then when they come to shore again, they meet Jairus, who's concerned about his daughter, who's at the point of death. But as they're on their way, Jesus also encounters what? The woman with the flow of blood, and you have the healing of her. And then as that, then you then go to Jairus' home, and Jesus raises Jairus' daughter, who at that point, by that point, has, has died. Okay, so that's sort of the extended um, passage we want to give attention to. Uh, and so you do have this sort of collection of stories, but obviously Mark has put these stories together in a very intentional way. And what we want to do is look at that extended passage to see what it has to say about fear, and then also what it has to say about the understanding and belief. Because what's interesting is that fear, surprisingly enough, becomes a very interesting theme in Mark's gospel. And it's in this, these passages we're looking at that fear is introduced for the first time in Mark's gospel. So what we want to explore is what we can learn from that theme in Mark by looking at this passage. And in the first scene, the storm at the sea, uh, there we are introduced to two forms of fear. The first fear we see is that very natural fear of the disciples that they're afraid they're gonna lose their lives, okay? Many of these are seasoned fishermen, but they've never experienced a storm quite like this. And they're convinced they're going to die. So what do they do? They wake up Jesus, who interestingly enough is asleep. Uh, they wake up Jesus, say, you know, you know, don't you care that we are about to perish? And then as you know, Jesus gets up, speaks to the sea, rebukes the wind, and everything is calm, okay? But then a second form of fear sets in. When the disciples see this, when they see that Jesus, by merely speaking a word to this storm and to the sea, brings peace and stillness to the sea, another fear sets in. We read that they were filled with great awe, or as it, as it actually says in the Greek text, they feared with a great fear, and they said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So we have two kind of fears here. So that first order of fear, you could say, that kind of fear, of, fear of death, okay, this very natural kind of fear. But then when they're confronted, and this is one of the, the earliest times in Mark's gospel where they're truly confronted with who he is, a different fear captures them. This fear of what we could call the fear of the numinous or the fear of the uncanny, 
they come face to face with something that takes them outside of their normal experience. They come to face to face with something very extraordinary and something that's not very easily explained. You know, Rudolf Otto in his famous book, The Idea of the Ho Holy, you know, talks about this idea of the numinous and how it generates what a feeling of awe or dread within a person. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, uh, at one point kind of sketches out these two different fears. Let me sort of read you this passage from that book. Uh, Lewis writes, suppose you were told that there was a tiger in the next room. You would know that you were in danger and would probably feel fear. But if you were told there is a ghost in the next room and you believed it, you would feel indeed what is often called fear, but of a different kind. It would not be based on the knowledge of danger, for no one is primarily afraid of what a ghost may do to him, but of the mere fact that it is a ghost. It is uncanny rather than dangerous. And the special kind of fear it excites may be called dread. He's simply echoing Otto there. With the uncanny, one has reached the fringes of the numinous. Now suppose that you were told simply, there is a mighty spirit in the room and believed it, your feelings would then be even less like the mere fear of danger, but the disturbance would nonetheless be profound. You would feel wonder and a certain shrinking described as awe, and the object which excites it is the numinous. So this, these passages we're looking at sort of play against those two types of fear. It's interesting that extended passage is actually bracketed with two descriptions of natural fear. The first being what we just mentioned, the disciples are afraid of the storm and, and the death that may ensue. Likewise, at the, the, the final bracket of that passage is Jairus, who experiences fear when he's told his daughter has died. Okay, And it's interesting, it's this fear of death, probably the most basic kind of fundamental of all human fears, this fear of death. That brackets this extended passage. And yet within those two brackets, we find three references to this fear of the numinous. So the first time is, as we noted, when the disciples are faced with this miracle and they're now forced to kind of see Jesus in a new way. They're fearful and they ask, who is this? Who is this person? Okay. Likewise, when Jesus, after they've crossed over and Jesus casts out the, 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 the demons from the, the demon-possessed man, the townspeople, when they hear of this, they come, and they're afraid. When they see the man sitting in his right mind and fully clothed and at peace, they're fearful. Why? Because they've encountered something they don't know how to explain. Okay. And likewise, also, right before the, the raising of Jairus' daughter, the woman with the issue of blood, when she by merely touching Jesus' garment and feeling this power go out from him. And then when Jesus tells her to come forward, she's filled with fear because obviously she's now experienced something that takes her out of the ordinary, okay? And she too is confronted with the numinous in the form of Jesus. Okay, we all understand natural fear and we understand its purpose. You know, fear is both a motivator, as we say, it's also an inhibitor. We kind of need fear. You know, fear will cause us at times to do what is necessary for our own survival. In that way, it is a motivator. But it will also prevent us from doing what is reckless or imprudent. You know, not so much with teenagers, but normal people, fear prevents them from doing things that are reckless. Okay, so we need fear to function. But what we want to explore is the purpose of this second kind of fear that we talk about. For Mark, part of the reason why he emphasizes fear is that if we're truly going to understand Jesus, and if we're truly going to understand what God is doing through Jesus, this inbreaking of the kingdom, we need to kind of go beyond that natural fear and in some ways come to understand better what this other fear is all about. Uh, for Mark, this fear is a necessary stage in, on the way to understanding Jesus. You know, later we will see in Mark's gospel the disciples experiencing this numinous fear time and time again. Um, 
You know, when they see Jesus walk on the Sea of Galilee, it's the same thing. You know, that's obviously a very numinous experience, seeing Jesus walk on the sea. Or at, on two occasions when they're walking towards Jerusalem and Jesus shares with them the passion, you know, with these famous passion predictions in Mark, when he tells them what's going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem, it jars them. They're frightened. And they're not just frightened at the prospect of death. They're frightened because there's something extraordinary, something unusual that Jesus is sharing with them at that point. And then, of course, how Mark ends his gospel is with the women at the tomb confronted with the angel who announces the resurrection of Jesus. And what do they do? They leave in fear. Okay, so it's interesting that the, the book of Mark actually ends on this note of fear. Okay. Um, but all of this is a necessary experience, you could say, for coming to know and truly understand what the inbreaking of the kingdom is about. Because as Mark describes it, that is the kingdom message. It's the breaking into the ordinary of the extraordinary. It's something that catches us off guard. Because sadly, even oftentimes as believers, we get too comfortable in just what? the ordinariness of this typical world we find ourselves in. And God wants to help us see that there is something much more radical, something much more profound. As he's redeeming this creation, he does so at times in very extraordinary ways that puts us in touch with the numinous, if you want to use that language. Um, and sadly, oftentimes as believers, that, that first type of fear interferes with us embracing or breaking through to kind of, you know, to embrace that second level of fear. Um, you know, often, what's, what's a natural fear? Fear of change. Oftentimes, we as believers fear change. We, we easily become content and sometimes therefore stagnant in our experience of God and in our in our desire to see God move, or we fear that we don't have what it takes to truly be a man or woman of God. We, we, so we have fears of doubt with respect to our own abilities. Or we maybe fear the sacrifices that we might need to make if we're really going to venture closer and closer to God and to what God is seeking to do in this world. Uh, or we might fear that we'll appear too, you know, super spiritual. You know, sometimes there's that fear. We don't want our friends or family to think that we become maybe too radical or too crazy or fanatic as a Christian. But anyways, there's, there's oftentimes, just within our Christian experience, natural fears that prevent us from sort of moving closer towards the numinous, as it were, and therefore making ourselves available to be agents of God's kingdom and agents of God's activity as he wants to kind of shake up this present age and transform it into the age to come. Um, that fear of the numinous is fear, but it's interesting within, as Mark would want us to see, it ultimately becomes what? Liberating. It becomes transformative. It becomes empowering. Because those natural fears, they are inhibitors of this true fear, which in some ways flows into that fear of God, okay? That kind of veneration and honor of God that God would want us to approach him with. You know, it's interesting that this extended passage begins with a command of Jesus to his disciples. So that whole extended passage begins with Jesus saying, let us cross over to the other side. And it's as the disciples do that, it's as they cross over to the other side that they experience these things that, that inform them of something new about Jesus. They're learning something new about Jesus each time. But it's interesting, it starts with that. And I think we'd want to understand this metaphorically. You know, literally within the text, literally they're going to cross over to the other side of, of the Sea of Galilee. But let's take that phrase of let's cross over to the other side as almost kind of functioning metaphorically because it's as the disciples cross over to the other side that they begin to be taken into these deeper experiences 
of who Jesus is and what Jesus is seeking to do. And as they do this, they cross over to a new understanding of Jesus. They break out of kind of a natural way of understanding things, and they begin to kind of move into this more profound way of seeing things. You know, a secular analogy to all of this, as I was thinking about this, a secular analogy, and this might this be a lot before your time, but this sort of dates me. But um, you know, a book that was very influential in the 1960s was Aldous Huxley. And what's interesting, I've, I've never ever in a sermon before put Lewis' quote and a Huxley side by side. And they both, you know, they're both British authors who both died on the exact same day. You know, they both died on the same day that uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated as well. But Huxley, who in some ways it's interesting, kind of parallels Lewis in some ways, but in kind of an obverse way, he writes this famous book called The Doors of Perception. And what he talks about in this book is sort of breaking through the doors of perception. And he's, he's seeking to get beyond what we see and what we think to be real to what is truly real. Okay, So we need to kind of break through those doors to discover what is truly real in life. Um, and then we begin to see aspects of life that we'd never seen before. Now, for Huxley, the catalyst for doing this was hallucinogenic drugs. Okay, So he's, ex he's experimenting with opiates in the 50s and 60s as he's doing this. And, and obviously, he's one of these people that's very much influential as far as the drug culture of the 1960s. And, and that book, The Doors of Perception, obviously what? The, the famous band from the 1960s, The Doors, take their name from the Huxley book. And it's very interesting. If you look at the, um, the very first album of The Doors and the very first, very first track on the first side of their first album, it's what? Break on through to the other side. Okay, this idea of breaking on through. Now there's the secular analogy to what Mark is talking about. But what that shows is that even just as human beings, there's a desire in every human, whether they're a believer or not, there's a recognition that what I understand to be true isn't really, there's a truth that goes beyond what I am presently seeing, what I am presently experiencing. Now sadly, a lot of people use drugs and other kinds of things to kind of break through but what you see in Mark's gospel here is Jesus encouraging his disciples, kind of stick with me, watch what I'm doing here, and if you're paying attention, and if you're open to what God is wanting to do in these situations, you will, in effect, break on through to the other side. You will cross over to the other side, and you'll begin to see things and understand things and know things about what God is seeking to do that otherwise you would miss. Okay, so as Christians, what we want to do is we want to kind of break outside of those, those natural things that we sometimes get locked into, those things that limit our vision of reality. We want to move beyond our fears, and we want to you know, enter into this true knowing of God. And even though that takes us maybe into new fearful territory, okay, encounters with the numinous, Nonetheless, that's, as far as Jesus is concerned, that's the only way to really track with what God is seeking to do in the present, and it's the only way to really fully enter into that fullness of life. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the truths contained in your word. We thank you for this promise that as we, as we go with you and as we observe you and as we seek to understand what you are doing at present and what you desire to do at present, and as you bring forth into this present age the um, power of your kingdom, at times this can be frightening to us. At times this can um, to dis disorient us. But we just pray that we would be people of faith who would seek to cross over along with you and see the glorious things that you seek to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.